Section 21 of The Three Hostages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Three Hostages by John Buchan. Chapter 20 McCray. A week later, after much consultation with Sandy, I wrote Medina a letter. The paper said he had gone abroad for a short rest, and I could imagine the kind of mental purgatory he was enduring in some Mediterranean bay. We had made up our mind to be content with success. Victory meant a long campaign in the courts and the press, and which no doubt we should have won, but for which I, at any rate, had no stomach. The whole business was a nightmare, which I longed to shut the door on. We had drawn his fangs, and for all I cared, he might go on with his politics and dazzle the world with his gifts, provided he kept his hands out of crime. I wrote and told him that, told him that the three people who knew everything would hold their tongues, but that they reserved the right to speak if he ever showed any sign of running crooked. I had no reply and did not expect one. I had lost all my hate for the man, and, so strangely are we made, what I mostly felt was compassion. We are all, even the best of us, egotists and self-deceivers, and without a little comfortable make-believe to clothe us we should freeze in the outer winds. I shuddered when I thought of the poor devil with his palace of cards about his ears and his naked soul. I felt that further triumph would be an offence against humanity. He must have got my message for in July he was back at his work, and made a speech at a big political demonstration which was highly commended in the papers. Whether he went about in society I do not know, for Sandy was in Scotland and I was at Fossey, and not inclined to leave it. Meantime, MacGillivray's business was going on and the press was full of strange cases, which no one seemed to think of connecting. I gathered from McGillivray that, though the syndicate was smashed to little bits, he had failed to make the complete bag of malefactors that he had hoped. In England there were three big financial exposures followed by long sentences. In Paris there was a first-rate political scandal and a crop of convictions. A labor agitator and a copper magnate in the Middle West went to jail for life, and there was the famous rounding up of the murder gang in Turin. But MacGillivray and his colleagues, like me, had success rather than victory. Indeed, in this world I don't think you can get both at once. You must make your choice. We saw Murcott at the house ball at Oxford, none the worse for his adventures, but rather the better, for he was a man now and not a light-witted boy. Early in July Mary and I went to Paris for Adela Victor's wedding the most gorgeous show I have ever witnessed, when I had the privilege of kissing the bride and being kissed by the bridegroom. Sir Arthur Warcliffe brought David to pay us a visit at Fossey, where the boy fished from dawn to dusk, and began to get some flesh on his bones. Archie Roylance arrived and the pair took such a fancy to each other that the three of them went off to Norway to have a look at the birds on Flaxholm. I was busy during those weeks making up arrears of time at Fossey, for my long absence had put out the whole summer program. One day I was down at the home meadow, planning a new outlet for one of the ponds. Sandy turned up, announcing that he must have a talk with me and could only spare twenty minutes. "'When does your tenancy of Macrae begin?' he asked. "'I have it now, ever since April. The sea-trout come early there.' And can you go up whenever you like? Yes, we propose starting about the 5th of August. Take my advice and start at once, he said. I asked why, though I guessed the reason. Because I'm not very happy about you here. You've insulted to the marrow the vainest and one of the cleverest men in the world. Don't imagine he'll take it lying down. You may be sure he is spending sleepless nights planning how he is to get even with you. It's you he is chiefly thinking about. Me he regards as a rival in the same line of business. He'd love to break me, but he'll trust to luck for the chance turning up. Lavita has been his slave and has escaped, but at any rate he once acknowledged his power. 
you have fooled him from start to finish, and left his vanity one raw, throbbing sore. He won't be at ease till he has had revenge on you, on you and your wife." "'Peter John!' I exclaimed. He shook his head. "'No, I don't think so. He won't try that line again, at any rate, not yet a while. But he would be much happier, Dick, if you were dead.' The thought had been in my mind for weeks, and had made me pretty uncomfortable. It is not pleasant to walk in peril of your life, and move about in constant expectation of your decease. I had considered the thing very carefully, and had come to the conclusion that I could do nothing but try to forget the risk. If I ever allowed myself to think about it, my whole existence would be poisoned. It was a most unpleasant affair, but, after all, the world is full of hazards. I told Sandy that. "'I'm quite aware of the danger,' I said. "'I always reckoned that as part of the price I had to pay for succeeding. But I'm hanged if I'm going to allow the fellow to score off me to the extent of disarranging my life.' "'You've plenty of fortitude, old fellow,' said Sandy. "'But you owe a duty to your family and your friends. Of course, you might get police protection from McGillivray, but that would be an infernal nuisance for you. And besides, what kind of police protection would avail against an enemy as subtle as Medina? No, I want you to go away. I want you to go to McRae now, and stay there till the end of October. What good would that do? He can follow me there if he wants to, and anyhow the whole thing would begin again when I came back. I'm not so sure, he said. In three months' time his wounded vanity may have healed. It's no part of his general game to have a vendetta with you, and only a passion of injured pride would drive him to it. Presently that must die down, and he will see his real interest. Then as for Macrae, why a Scotch deer forest is the best sanctuary on earth. Nobody can come up that long glen without your hearing about it, and nobody can move on the hills without half a dozen Argus-eyed stalkers and gillies following him. They're the right sort of police protection. I want you, for all our sakes, to go to Macrae at once. It looks like funking, I objected. Don't be an old ass. Is there any man alive who is not a raving maniac likely to doubt your courage? You know perfectly well that it is sometimes a brave man's duty to run away. I thought for a bit. I don't think he'll hire ruffians to murder me, I said. Why? Because he challenged me to a duel, proposed a place in the Pyrenees, and offered to let me choose both seconds. What did you reply? I wired, Try not to be a fool. It looks as if he wanted to keep the job of doing me in for himself. Very likely, and that doesn't mend matters. I'd rather face half a dozen cutthroats than Medina. What you tell me strengthens my argument. I was bound to admit that Sandy talked sense, and after he had gone I thought the matter out and decided to take his advice. Somehow the fact that he should have put my suspicions into words made them more formidable and I knew again the odious feeling of the hunted. It was hardly fear, for I think that, if necessary, I could have stayed on at Fosse and gone about my business with a stiff lip. But all the peace of the place had been spoiled. If a bullet might at any moment come from a covert, that was the crude way I envisaged the risk, then good-bye to the charm of my summer meadows. The upshot was that, I warned Tom Greenslade to be ready to take his holiday, and by the 20th of July he and I and Mary and Peter John were settled in a little whitewashed lodge tucked into the fold of a birch-clad hill, and looking alternately at a shrunken river and a cloudless sky, while we prayed for rain. McCrae in calm weather is the most solitary place on earth, lonelier and quieter even than a Boer farm lost in some hollow of the veld. The mountains rise so sheer and high that it seems that only a bird could escape, and the road from the sea lock ten miles away is only a strip of heather-grown sand which looks as if it would end a mile off at the feet of each steep hill shoulder. But when the gales come, and the rain is lashing the roof, 
and the river swirls at the garden edge, and the birches and rowans are tossing, then a thousand voices talk, and one lives in a world so loud that one's ears are deafened and one's voice acquires a sharp pitch of protest from shouting against the storm. We had a few gales, and the last week of July was a very fair imitation of the tropics. The hills were cloaked in a heat haze, the Acil River was a chain of translucent pools with a few reddening salmon below the ledges, the burns were thin trickles, the sun drew hot scents out of the heather and bog myrtle, and movement was a weariness to man and beast. That was for the daytime. But every evening, about five o'clock, there would come a light wind from the west, which scattered the haze and left a land swimming in cool amber light. Then Mary and Tom Greenslade and I would take to the hills, and return well on for midnight to a vast and shameless supper. Sometimes in the hot noontides I went alone, with old Angus the head stalker, and long before the season began I had got a pretty close knowledge of the forest. The reader must bear with me while I explain the lie of the land. The twenty thousand acres of Macrae extend on both sides of the Aesil Glen, but principally to the south. West lies the Macrae Sea Lock, where the hills are low and green and mostly sheep ground. East, up to the river head, is Glenacil Forest, the lodge of which is beyond the watershed and the shore of another sea lock, and on our side of the divide there is only a stalker's cottage. Glenacil is an enormous place, far too big to be a single forest. It had been leased for years by Lord Glenfinnan, an uncle of Archie Roylance, but he was a frail old gentleman of over seventy who could only get a stag when they came down to the low ground in October. The result was that the place was ridiculously undershot, and all the western end, which adjoined Macrae, was virtually a sanctuary. It was a confounded nuisance, for it made it impossible to stalk our northern beat except in a southwest wind, unless you wanted to shift the deer onto Glenacil, and that beat had all our best grazing and seemed to attract all our best heads. Harapal Forest to the south was not so large, but I should think it was the roughest ground in Scotland. Macrae had good beat south of the Aesil, right up to the watershed, and two noble quarries, the Quarry Nasith and the Quarry Essen. Beyond the watershed was the Glen of the Reskill, both sides of which were Harapal ground. The Macrae heights were all over the three thousand feet, but rounded and fairly easy going but the Harapol peaks beyond the stream were desperate rock mountains, Stop Ben, Stop Coriessen, Skirmore, comprising some of the most difficult climbing in the British Isles. The biggest and hardest top of all was at the head of the Reskill, Skirdarg with its two pinnacle ridges, its three prongs, and the awesome precipice of its eastern face. Macrae marched with Harapol on its summit, but it wasn't often that any of our stalkers went that way. All that upper part of the Reskill was a series of cliffs and chasms, and the red deer, who was no rock climber, rarely ventured there. For the rest, these four southern beats of ours were as delightful hunting ground as I have ever seen, and the ladies could follow a good deal of the stalking by means of a big telescope in the library window of the lodge. Macrae was a young man's forest, for the hills rose steep almost from the sea level and you might have to go up and down three thousand feet several times in a day. But Harapol, at least the north and east parts of it, was fit only for athletes, and it seemed to be its fate to fall to tenants who were utterly incapable of doing it justice. In recent years it had been leased successively to an elderly distiller, a young racing ne'er-do-well who drank, and a plump American railway king. It was now in the hands of a certain middle-aged Midland manufacturer, Lord Claybody, who had won an easy fortune and an easier peerage during the war. "'Ah, he will be killed,' Angus said. "'He will never get up a hundred feet of Harapol without being killed.' So I found myself, to my disgust, afflicted with another unauthorized sanctuary. Angus was very solemn about it. He was a lean, anxious man, just over fifty, with a face not unlike a stag's, amazingly fast on the hills, a finished cragsman, and with all the Highlander's subtle courtesy. 
Kennedy, the second stalker, was of lowland stock. His father had come to the north from Galloway in the days of the boom in sheep, and had remained as a keeper when sheep prices fell. He was a sturdy young fellow, apt to suffer on steep slopes on a warm day, but strong as an ox and with a better head than Angus for thinking out problems of weather and wind. Though he had the Gaelic, he was a true lowlander, plain-spoken and imperturbable. It was a contrast of new and old, for Kennedy had served in the war and learned many things beyond the other's ken. He knew, for example, how to direct your eye to the point he wanted, and would give intelligent directions like a battery observer, whereas with Angus it was always, Do you see yon stone? Ay, but do you see another stone? And so forth. Kennedy, when we sat down to rest, would smoke a cigarette in a holder, while Angus lit the dottle in a foul old pipe. In the first fortnight of August we had alternate days of rain, real drenching torrents, and the Aesil rose and let the fish up from the sea. There were few sea-trout that year, but there was a glorious run of salmon. Greenslade killed his first, and by the end of a week had a bag of twelve, while Mary, with the luck which seems to attend casual lady anglers, had four in one day to her own rod. Those were pleasant days, though there were mild damp afternoons when the midges were worse than tropical mosquitoes. I liked it best when a breeze rose, and the sun was hot and we had all our meals by the waterside. Once at luncheon we took with us an iron pot, made a fire, and boiled a fresh-killed salmon in his brew, a device I recommend to anyone who wants the full flavor of that noble fish. Archie Roydance arrived on August 16th, full of the lust of hunting. He reported that they had seen nothing remarkable in the way of birds at Flaxholm, but that David Warcliffe had had great sport with the sea-trout. "'There's a good boy for you,' he declared. "'First-class little sportsman, and to see him and his father together made me want to get wedded straight off.' I thought him a bit hipped at Fossey, but the North Sea put him right, and I left him as jolly as a grig. By the way, what was the matter with him in the summer? I gathered that he had been seedy or something, and the old man can't let him out of his sight. Let's get in, Angus, and talk dear. Angus was ready to talk dear till all hours. I had fixed the twenty-first for the start of the season, though the beasts were in such forward condition that we might have begun four days earlier. Angus reported that he had already seen several stags clear of velvet, but he was inclined to be doleful about our neighbors. "'My uncle Alexander is past praying for,' says Archie. "'He lives for that forest of his, and he won't have me there early in the season, for he says I have no judgment about beasts and won't listen to the stalkers. In October, you see, he has me under his own eye. He refuses to let a stag be killed unless it's a hummel or a diseased ancient. The result is the place is crawling with fine stags that have begun to go back and won't perish till they're fairly mouldering. Poor notion of a stud has my uncle Alexander. What about Herapol? Who has it this year? When he heard, he exclaimed delightedly, I know old Claybody, rather a good old fellow in his way, and uncommon free-handed. Rum old bird, too. He once introduced his son to me as the Honorable Johnson Claybody. Fairly wallows in his peerage. You know, he wanted to take the title of Lord Oxford, because he had a boy going up to Magdalen, but even the Herald's College jibbed at that. But he'll never get up those Herapole hills. He's a little fat puffin' old man. I'm not very spry on my legs now, but compared to Claybody, I'm a gazelle. He'll maybe have visitors, said Angus. You bet he will. He'll have the large stuff with young men, for there are various honourable clay-body daughters. Don't fancy there'll be much good on the hill, though. They will not be good, Sir Archibald, said the melancholy Angus. There will be some of them on the hill already. There'll be no better than tourists. Tourists, I should explain, were the poison in Angus's cup. By that name he meant people who trespassed on a deer forest during, or shortly before, the stalking season, and had not the good manners to give him notice and ask his consent. He distinguished them sharply from what he called montaniers, a class which he respected, 
for they were modest and civil folk, who came usually with ropes and ice-axes early in the spring, and were accustomed to feast off Angus's ham and eggs and thaw their frozen limbs by Angus's fire. If they came at other seasons, it was after discussing their roots with Angus. They went where no deer could travel, and spent their time, as he said, shamming themselves into chimneys. But the tourist was blatant and foolish and abundantly discourteous. He tramped, generally in a noisy party, over deer ground, and if remonstrated with, became truculent. A single member of the species could wreck the stalking on a beat for several days. The next I see on Macrae, said Angus, I will be rolling down a big stone on him. Some of the Herapold guests, it appeared, were of this malign breed, and had been wandering thoughtlessly over the forest, thereby wrecking their own sport and mine. They would have Alan MacNichol's heart broke, he concluded. And Alan was saying to me that they was awful bad shots. They were shooting at the big stone and missing it. And they will have little ponies to ride up to the tops, but the creatures is no use at walking. I hope they would have fall down and break their necks. They can't all be bad shots, said Archie. By the way, Dick, I forgot to tell you. You know Medina, Dominic Medina? You once told me you knew him. Well, I met him on the steamer, and he said he was going to put in a week with old Claybody. That piece of news took the light out of the day for me. If Medina was at Harapol, it was most certainly with a purpose. I had thought little about the matter since I arrived at Macrae, for the place had an atmosphere of impregnable seclusion, and I seemed to have shut a door on my recent life. I had fallen into a mood of content and whole-hearted absorption in the ritual of wild sport. But now my comfort vanished. I looked up at the grim wall of hills towards Harapol and wondered what mischief was hatching behind it. I warned Angus and Kennedy and the Gillies to keep a good lookout for trespasses. Whenever one was seen, they were to get their glasses on him and follow him and report his appearance and doings to me. Then I went out alone to shoot a brace of grouse for the pot, and considered the whole matter very carefully. I had an instinct that Medina had come to these parts to have a reckoning with me, and I was determined not to shirk it. I could not go on living under such a menace. I must face it and reach a settlement. To marry, of course, I could say nothing. And I saw no use in telling either Archie or Greenslade. It was, metaphorically, and perhaps literally, my own funeral. But next morning I did not go fishing. Instead, I stayed at home and wrote out a full account of the whole affair up to Medina's appearance at Harapol, and I set down baldly what I believed to be his purpose. This was in case I went out one day and did not return. When I finished it, I put the document in my dispatch box and felt easier, as a man feels when he has made his will. I only hoped the time of waiting would not be prolonged. The twenty-first was a glorious blue day, with a morning haze which promised heat. What wind there was came from the southeast, so I sent Archie out on the Cori Essen beat and went myself, with one giddy, to Clock Gless, which is the western peak on the north bank of the Asil. I made a practice of doing my own stalking, and by this time I knew the ground well enough to do it safely. I saw two shootable stags, and managed to get within range of one of them, but spared him for the good of the forest, as he was a young beast whose head would improve. I had a happy and peaceful day, and found to my relief that I wasn't worrying about the future. The clear air and the great spaces seemed to have given me the placid fatalism of an Arab. When I returned, I was greeted by Mary with the news that Archie had got a stag, and that she had followed most of his stalk through the big telescope. Archie himself arrived just before dinner, very cheerful and loquacious. He found that his game leg made him slow, but he declared that he was not in the least tired. At dinner we had to listen to every detail of his day, and we had a sweep on the beast's weight, which Mary won. Afterwards, in the smoking-room, he told me more. Those infernotators from Harapod were out today. Pretty wild shots they must be. When we were luncheon, a spent bullet whistled over our heads, a long way off to be sure, but I call it uncommon bad form. 
You should have heard Angus curse in Gaelic. Look here, Dick. I've a good mind to drop a line to old Claybody and ask him to caution his people. The odds are a million to one, of course, against their doing any harm, but there's always that millionth chance. I had a feeling today as if the war had started over again. I replied that if anything of the sort happened a second time, I would certainly protest, but I pretended to make light of it, as a thing only possible with that particular brand of wind. But I realized now what Medina's plans were. He had been tramping about Harapole, getting a notion of the lie of the land, and I knew that he had a big-game hunter's quick eye for country. He had fostered the legend of wild shooting among the Harapole guests, and probably he made himself the wildest of the lot. The bullet which sang over Archie's head was a proof, but he waited on the chance of a bullet which would not miss. If a tragedy happened, everyone would believe it was a pure accident. There would be heartbroken apologies, and, though Sandy and one or two others would guess the truth, nothing could be proved, and, in any case, it wouldn't help me. Of course, I could stalk only in the north beats of Macrae, but the idea no sooner occurred to me than I dismissed it. I must end this hideous suspense. I must accept Medina's challenge, and somehow or other reach a settlement. When Angus came in for orders, I told him that I was going stalking on the Kori Nasith beat the day after tomorrow, and asked him to send word privately to Alan McNichol at Harapole. "'It will be no use, sir,' he groaned. "'The visitors will no heed, Alan.' But I told him to send word nevertheless. I wanted to give Medina the chance he sought— it was my business to draw his fire. Next day we slacked and fished. In the afternoon I went a little way up the hill called Clockless, from which I could get a view of the ground on the south side of the Asil. It was a clear, quiet day, with the wind steady in the southeast, and promising to continue there. The great green hollow of Corina Seath was clear in every detail. Much of it looked like a tennis court, but I knew that what seemed smooth sward was really matted blaeberries and hidden boulders, and that the darker patches were breast-high bracken and heather. Cori Essen I could not see, for it was hidden by the long spur of Bain Fara, over which peeped the cloven summit of Skurdarg. I searched all the ground with my glasses, and picked up several lots of hinds and a few stags, but there was no sign of human activity. There seemed to be a rifle out, however, on Glen Asel Forest, for I heard two faraway shots toward the northeast. I lay a long time amid the fern, with bees humming round me and pipits calling, and an occasional buzzard or peregrine hovering in the blue, thinking precisely the same thoughts that I used to have in France the day before a big action. It was not exactly nervousness that I felt, but a sense that the foundations of everything had got loose and that the world had become so insecure that I had better draw down the blinds on hoping and planning and everything and become a log. I was very clear in my mind that next day was going to bring the crisis. Of course, I didn't want Mary to suspect, but I forgot to caution Archie, and that night at dinner, as ill luck would have it, he mentioned that Medina was at Harapole. I could see her eyes grow troubled, for I expect she had been having the same anxiety as myself these past weeks, and had been too proud to declare it. As we were going to bed, she asked me point-blank what it meant. "'Nothing in the world,' I said. "'He is a great stalker and a friend of the clay bodies. I don't suppose he has the remotest idea that I am here. Anyhow, that affair is all over. He is not going to cross our path if he can help it.' The one wish in his heart is to avoid us. She appeared to be satisfied, but I don't know how much she slept that night. I never woke till six o'clock, but when I opened my eyes I felt too big a load on my heart to let me stay in bed, so I went down to the garden pool and had a swim. That invigorated me, and indeed it was not easy to be depressed in that gorgeous morning— with the streamers of mist still clinging to the high tops, and the whole glen a harmony of singing birds and tumbling waters. I noticed that the wind, what there was of it, seemed to have shifted more to the east. 
a very good quarter for the Cory Nasith beat. Angus and Kennedy were waiting outside the smoking room, and even the pessimism of the head stalker was mellowed by the weather. I think, he said slowly, we will be getting a stag. There was a big beast on Ben Fadda yesterday. Kennedy seen him. A great beast he was, maybe nineteen stone, but Kennedy never right seen his head. We'd better be moving on, sir. Mary whispered in my ear. There's no danger, Dick. You're sure? I have never heard her voice more troubled. Not a scrap, I laughed. It's an easy day, and I ought to be back for tea. You'll be able to follow me all the time through the big telescope. We started at nine. As I left, I had a picture of Greenslade sitting on a garden seat busy with flycasts, and Archie smoking his pipe and reading a three days old times, and Peter John going off with his nurse, and Mary looking after me with a curious tense gaze. Behind, the smoke of the chimneys was rising straight into the still air, and the finches were twittering among the Prince Charlie roses. The sight gave me a pang. I might never enter my little kingdom again. Neither wife nor friends could help me. It was my own problem, which I must face alone. We crossed the bridge, and began to plod upwards through a wood of hazels. In such fashion I entered upon the strangest day of my life. End of Section 21